All right, so let's get started with the second argument in the week 14 slides. And this is another very well-known one. It's known as Moore's open question argument. So this is the same GE Moore that we looked at uh, when we looked at refutations of skepticism some weeks back. And similarly, this argument is, is still influential, but people seem to think that Moore's original version of it actually isn't very good. So Moore has this kind of dubious status of giving all sorts of people really great ideas from his not so great ideas. That's very uncharitable, but you know, it's a kind of humorous way to look at it. Okay, so this one's going to be a bit more complicated. It's a bit more uh, logical. It, it has more sort of logical jargon in it. So we'll go through it. <clears throat> Premise one. Suppose that the predicate good is synonymous with some other predicate n. Let's say pleasurable. Predicate here it just means a word which is um, attributing a property to an object, right? So um, uh, a predicate is something like is good, right, or good. Uh, and then you predicate that, that is, you attribute it to some object. Uh, this cake is good. You are predicating goodness of the cake, right? So again, like I said, this is fancy lar uh, logical jargon. Premise two, X has the property N will mean X is good, right? So the idea here is that if you make good synonymous with, that is, mean the same thing as pleasurable, then whenever you say that something is good, excuse me, whenever you say that something is pleasurable, you will also be saying that it is good, right? So when we assign uh, pleasurable to the predicate N and say that n is synonymous with good, then when we say x is pleasurable, we mean that x is good. Okay, conclusion one. Anybody who would ask whether an x with property n is good would ipso facto, that it means by that very uh, fact, betray conceptual confusion. They are unaware what good means. So the idea is if that good and pleasurable mean the same thing, and then I come up to you and I say, well, yeah, it's pleasurable, but is it good? You're just going to look at me like, what? Don't you know what good means? It just means pleasurable. You can't ask me that question. Go back to, you know, fifth grade English or whatever. So that's what they mean when they say it would betray conceptual confusion. It would show that you don't know how to speak English in this case, that you don't know what words mean. P3, however, for every n, it is always an open question whether an x with property n is good. It is meaningful, it is a meaningful question that does not demonstrate conceptual confusion. Premise four, if for every n, it is always an open question whether an x with property n is good, then n cannot be synonymous with good. Therefore, n cannot be synonymous with good. If n cannot be synonymous with good, then only good can be synonymous with good. Therefore, good is a simple or primitive concept and cannot be defined. C3. Only good can be synonymous with good. Therefore, good is a simple or primitive concept and cannot be defined. Uh, so that's the open question argument. Um, there's a lot that probably doesn't make sense here because it's very jargony. Um, despite the fact that it's jargony, uh, what it means is pretty straightforward. So let's take a look at some analysis here. Um, what Moore is looking at, what he's doing with this argument, is he's trying to target um, theories of good, that is, uh, value theories like hedonism, which says, hey, there is this one thing, and it's the only thing which is good. So the hedonist says happiness is the only thing which is good. So for the hedonist, they would say, um, predicate n, happiness, is synonymous with good. So whenever you say uh, this thing is happy making, then you are saying this thing is good, automatically, by definition. That's what the hedonist wants to say. Um, so happiness is good, and so coffee is happy making, just mean the same thing is coffee is good, right? Um, anything that's happy making is therefore good. 
Uh, when we say that good and happy making are synonymous, we just mean that you can substitute them in any context, and the sentence, the sentence's meaning stays the same, and the sentence's truth value stays the same. Um, so, uh, if these things are synonymous, then asking the question, is happy making coffee good? That sounds like gibberish. Um, is pleasurable coffee good? Uh, uh, it, if hedonism is right, then asking that sort of question should show that you're confused or ignorant in some way. But Moore says it doesn't show that. You, if you ask, sure, this coffee, uh, you know, is pleasurable, but does that mean that it's good in some moral sense? He wants to say that that's a reasonable question. So Moore is contending that it will always make sense to ask questions like, is happy making coffee good, right? So this is much like the perfect question, uh, the objection to egalitarianism, uh, where we say, well, um, it, equalizing, is it is it good, right? Uh, is an equalizing so-and-so good? Uh, we can't make equalizing, equality making, synonymous with good any more than we can make uh, pleasurable or happy making synonymous with good. The idea is that if all these questions make sense, and when we say they make sense, uh, that means that you can ask them without um, without it demonstrating some kind of um, ignorance or conceptual confusion on your part, uh, then there is no single property with which we can identify goodness. So let's go back a second and make sure that's clear. Um, so Moore says, whatever you put here for n, it's going to make sense for you to ask that question. So you could say happiness, pleasure, power, um, equality, um, virtue, uh, fulfilling your obligations. For all of those, it will make sense to ask, well, sure, it fulfills your obligations, but is it good? Well, sure, it grants you power, but is it good? Well, sure, um, it tastes like chicken, but is it good, right? All of those questions are supposed to be sensible. And if for everything that you could plug in here for n, it's not really synonymous with good, then only good is synonymous with good, right? That's what Moore is trying to get at here. Good is synonymous only with itself. The only thing that means good is good. That's how he gets this idea that good is a simple or primitive concept. So a primitive concept doesn't mean that it's like stupid and retrograde and cavemen thought up it thought it up. Um, it means that it does not admit of further definition. It means the buck stops there. It means that you can't subdivide it anymore. So think of a primitive concept like a fundamental particle. You cannot split it, right? So originally, atom, the word atom, A-T-O-M, means indivisible, unsplittable, right? So atoms were supposed to be the indivisible, indestructible, uh, fundamental constituents of the physical world, right? It turns out that they're not. Um, but when we, I'm, I'm just doing this for purpose of analogy. When we say that good is primitive, we just mean that it is... Um, semantically indivisible, right? There is no further definition. Ask me to define good and I'll just be like, well, something is good when it's good, right? That's what we, that's what we mean when we say it cannot be defined. So um, uh, the definition of good does not mention pleasurable. It does not mention um, uh, equality making. It does not mention taste like chicken, right? So if for every n it is always an open question whether x with property n is good, then no n can be synonymous with good. Only good be, can be synonymous with good, right? So as I just said here, primitive concepts are concepts that do not meet a definition. What does it mean for something to be good? It just means that it's good. That sounds very unhelpful. Um, but Moore is making a point. Moore is saying uh, the project of trying to um, reduce goodness to a single natural property like pleasure um, or happiness or um, you know wealth whatever is doomed to fail 
any time you try and define good in terms of some other thing which we have a better grasp on, which we can measure or whatever, it's not going to work. That's what he's getting at. Um, so as I said when I started off, the open question argument is very influential, but the particular form which it takes in Moore's original uh, articulation is, is sort of not the one that people go to <clears throat> when they're doing this argument. So, uh, as the textbook says, Moore's argument deals with the meanings of terms rather than the properties of objects. Uh, Moore, uh, no pun intended, uh, recent and sophisticated versions of the open question argument refer to properties of objects rather than meanings of terms. And there's all kinds of very complicated reasons for that. Uh, the textbook mentions some of them. We're not going to go into it. I basically just want you to get the gist of the open question argument. And that just is that there is no single <clears throat> reductive definition of good into a more tractable, measurable, single other property, right? So uh, Moore says, if anyone tells you that uh, what is good is what makes you happy, and that's all, then they're wrong. It makes sense to, and you should question, well, this makes me happy, but is it good, right? Um, so Moore says that good is uh, simple, indivisible, primitive. Um, you could take another lesson from this. You could say, well, there is no single property which is good. It's some kind of weird uh, um, amalgamation of a whole bunch of different things. Something is good if it makes you happy and or fulfills your obligations and or tastes like chicken and or garners you power you know, some very complicated list of things which some specific number of have to be fulfilled, right? Moore doesn't go that way. You could go that way, um, but Moore does not. Okay, so um, the next thing I want you to look at is, the, is another very well-known argument. It's the error theory argument. This is by a philosopher called J.L. Mackey, um, a 20th century American philosopher. Um, hopefully it should be fairly straightforward. Uh, to give you a general idea, uh, error theory is a version of moral nihilism. That is, it's going to tell you that there are no moral truths. Um, and so uh, when you're reading it, keep in mind that it's basically a version of nihilism. Uh, so your arguments, uh, excuse me, your assignments in the reading sequence, again, all of which are bonus, will be based on chapter 59, which is the error theory argument of J.L. Mackey. Um, it's actually a series of arguments. Uh, there's different parts of the error theory argument. You'll see when you read it. Uh, this is another very important and influential argument, um, uh, which leads to a particular version of meta-ethics. So if you ever go and take um, like Dr. Coates' ethical theory class, um, uh, Later on in your career here at ETSU, you will probably look at um, the sort of things that grow out of Mackey's error theory. So that's the last substantive lecture on new material for this course. Um, I do hope that you found this course enlightening, illuminating, and even entertaining. Um, you know, there have been a couple of you know rough patches along the way in getting this sort of. Uh, um, especially like the lecture viewing and grading for the lecture viewing uh, smoothed out. Uh, so uh, I do apologize for any um, sort of stops and starts in the course. Uh, generally, I think things ran pretty smoothly. It seems like for the most part, people kept fairly well engaged with everything um, throughout the whole course. Uh, the discussion sections uh, worked fairly well. Um, the active reading, once people got into the, the rhythm of it, it looks like that panned out. Uh, people's ability to summarize things got better for the most part. So from my perspective, the course all in all seems to be a success. Um, if you agree or if you disagree, uh, you can voice that opinion in the uh, course evaluations, which you should be, you've probably gotten emails about them to access those. It would really help me if you took those course evaluations so I could get some feedback on this, given that it's the first iteration of, of this online introductory to philosophy course here at ETSU. I would like to refine it, and you know, if I get some good feedback, uh, 
quickly. And good feedback can be constructively negative, which is to say, Dr. Butts, um, I enjoyed this part of the class, uh, but this part was not so great. I think you could do it better. Uh, anything like that is welcome because I do want to make the course better uh, to make it uh, more, more, work more smoothly, be more informative, uh, be more engaging for uh, subsequent courses. So I would appreciate your feedback on that. Um, I will, uh, I've mentioned the final exam. I've put up uh, the due date for it. Um, I will be recording some more recap sections because I've missed a whole bunch of those and I'll go and put those back in the relevant weeks so that while you're studying, you can get a sort of shorter and sweeter version of uh, the sort of high points from each chapter. Um, but otherwise, there will be no more uh, recorded material that you need to look at. Uh, just as with the midterm, there won't be a sort of written study guide. All of these uh, presentation slides, they contain the information you need to know. All of these lectures, they contain the information you need to know. Um, and then, of course, the readings will help you uh, uh, get a deeper understanding of some of that. So just like before, whatever you did before on the, on, on the midterm, provided that it worked well, do that again. Um, if you have any questions about particular issues from a particular week, please feel free to ask me. Um, and I will let you know what other things develop between now and the final. I will be getting all the grades straightened out. Um, there's, a, there's, of course, the stuff that you just turned in for week 13, and then there'll be this bonus stuff that I still have to grade. So there's a good amount of grading yet to come, uh, and that should all be done, including your finals, uh, by December 17th. On the 17th, I will post the, the final grades. Uh, I won't submit them to the registrar yet. You'll have a day to look over them and let me know if there are any discrepancies. And then on the 18th, I have to submit them by noon. So once I put them up on the 17th, you need to look at them fast and let me know if there's anything that we can straighten out. So thanks again for uh, sticking with me through this course, and uh, maybe I'll see you again.